great directors are masters of controlled chaos. The controlled chaos that's behind any movie from inception to release. Join us as we talk to some of the brilliant minds behind this year's most admired movies. On this episode, we have Angelina Jolie, Unbroken. Mike Lee, Mr. Turner. Richard Linklater, Boyhood. Bennett Miller, Foxcatcher. Christopher Nolan, Interstellar. And Morton Tilden, The Imitation Game. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, The Directors. I'm Stephen Galloway, and welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, The Directors. I'd like to welcome Bennett Miller, Morton Tilden, Christopher Nolan, Mike Lee, Angelina Jolie, and Richard Linklater. I want to start with the precise moment each of you really decided that directing was your path. I started making films when I was about seven years old, Super 8, you know, epics. And uh, I remember being about 12 when I sort of sort of figuring out what the job of a director was, thinking that's kind of what I think of as filmmaking. What is the job of a director? Filmmaking, you know, just well, that putting to images abstract. together. Well, but it is, but it is abstract, because the thing is, you go on a set and, you know, I don't shoot the film, I don't record the sound, I don't, you know, you sit there in the middle of it all trying to be a conductor or something, I don't know, trying to be helpful, trying to be a lens for everybody else's input and focus it. Which aspect are you most comfortable with and which one are you not? Be probably being a jack of all trades, knowing a, a little bit about everything but not enough about any one thing to, to specialise. <laughs> I'm pretty comfortable being an instant expert on a bunch of different things without really digging in, in too much. I think being a director is a great job for mediocrity. It's like, you know, because you do, you have to know a lot of different things and kind of get on with people. Do you agree with that, Mike? Absolutely. <laughs> to answer your first question, I was 12, the snow was falling, my grandfather had just died, everybody was in the house, old men were carrying the coffin down the stairs, there was a guy with a very long nose, a very long drip, and I remember thinking, this is like a great film. That's what I want to do. I want to make films about things like this. Mm. Well, then, did you make films about things like that? Yes, and I've been making films about things like that. But, I mean, you know, I think we all probably share the same... You know, we, it's a, an impulse to tell stories, to make things up, to get people doing things, to put on shows, to be funny, to, be, to horrify people, confronting them with stuff, you know. I mean, all of that is in your DNA, really, and I think, if I'm honest, I been doing it since I was so high. Mr. Turner seems to have taken leave of form altogether. Turner. Clearly losing his eyesight. The masterpiece I here present, which Mr. Turner has just sent. You're a writer too. Yeah. Which aspect do you prefer, the writing or directing? Well, that's, for me, they're indivisible. I mean, they really are. I don't. I can't tell you where one ends, and it, but because I don't write formal scripts and I make it all up with the actors and we shoot it and make it up as we go along, I really can't define the difference between the two parts of the process. But as uh, I said, I mean, it's all about all aspects of the whole process. We don't make films by ourselves. We do make them. We collaborate with a whole bunch of other people. Are you afraid when you make films? Yes. I've never made a film where I didn't think this, this is the one, this is the disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Old, this is, by the way. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, every time. Se seeing the first edit is the worst. Is it? I mean, yeah, you, you, you're terrified and you see the assembly and you think, oh. Yeah, yeah. I don't watch I it assembly this for exactly that reason. I've never oh. watched it. I just, I couldn't face it. Four hours, like the, yeah. the crummy version of what you've done. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's funny because the editor's killed sometimes talks about wanting to call mm. it the editor's cut. But it's ridiculous because the, the poor editor has to cut every day, put it together, put it together, and that's and can't, what's there at the end. And he can't take out anything, you know, everything has yeah. to be in the movie, it's exactly. long, it's dreadful, and you hate it, and it's, it's, it's the worst experience watching your first film. It's so comforting to hear. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's terrifying, it's, the, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It's never as good as the dailies, and it's never as bad as the yeah, first complete assembly cut. Well, why do you get them to do a rough assembly if you're not going to watch it? Well, because it's there as a document to tell you whether you're getting everything you need. And so Lee, my editor, he'll call me up and 
if there's something he doesn't understand, why didn't you get this shot, why didn't you get that? And then I'll look at something scene by scene. But it's, it's sort of for him to know everything we've got and give me feedback. And we sit there and watch dailies every night and talk about it, you know, whatever. But then when we get in the edit suite, we'll, so we'll look at a few scenes that go and then go back to dailies and watch all the dailies and start putting it together. I'm coming back. I love you forever. Potentially habitable worlds right within our reach. You could save us from extinction. Here we go. You can't just think about your family. Now you have to think bigger than that. I am thinking about my family and millions of other families. Actually, you're, you're fairly new to directing. Did the fear get less or more when you did Unbroken? First big film. It was a different kind of fear. <laughs> yeah. I, I got into, I think, the, to answer the question about how do you get into it, mm. I, I got into this accidentally in that I, I was one of those actors, they say, do you want to direct? And I'd always say, no, absolutely not. Huh. And um, I wanted to learn more about the war in Yugoslavia, so I wrote something that was a project that was really private. I didn't think mm -hmm. I was going to show anybody. So it was this little script that I used as an excuse to kind of send myself back to school and study a, a time in history. And then somebody said, you know, it's not that bad. It should be a... A film and I was so excited and then the idea of who would direct it came up and I was worried that it would be turned into something else by somebody else and so I volunteered to direct it and thought oh what am I doing wow but just to protect the material and then realized that I loved it but I was uh, I was afraid of that one because it was my first and I was afraid of it because the war was very fresh and there was a lot of hostility in country and would it ignite new new violence so I was actually politically very concerned. And Broken, I was very concerned because it was something bigger than mm -hmm. I'd ever done. And it was well beyond my skill set when I started. And I had a lot to learn. And the subject matter was my friend and hero who I desperately did not want to let down. How did that project come to you? It was on an open directing list. So it came to all of us. Oh, really? <laughs> I was the crazy one that thought, I read some of the earlier drafts and and then I read Laura Hill and Brad's book. I had the good fortune of having this extraordinary book and, and the way she writes is so visual that as you read through it, you can't help but want to see it. But I didn't, I didn't know what it was about when I first got involved. I thought it was about heroics and a man that could do extraordinary things and I wasn't that interested. And then I realized what it was about and it's about the strength of the human spirit and it was inspiring and I, and I wanted to walk in his footsteps and I wanted to take that journey. Mm. And I'm happy I did because it was, I learned a lot. What did you learn? I learned to be a better person even more uh, open to my fellow man, to understanding, to seeing the other side, that when you have hate and anger and you let it eat yourself up, it's only hurting you, it doesn't hurt your enemy. And I learned that when we look at the news today and we see all the things going on in the world and we feel like all is lost, that in fact, there is great strength to a strong heart, an indomitable will, an unbreakable spirit that exists in each one of us. It made me uh, face every day and every challenge differently. It's going to make me raise my children differently. Specifically how? Because that fire we see in our children is a great thing. And I certainly was one of those people that thought that this fire inside was maybe a bad thing. And I think there's beauty to unrest and, and fight. And we have to channel it the right way. We have to teach our children to channel it the right way. We need to know what there is to fight for that is valuable, that's the right thing to fight in this, in this world. When Louis had an obstacle, no matter what it was, he thought, fantastic, there's a new mountain to climb. No matter what it is, no matter what pain would come, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rise up to it and I'm gonna make it make me better. I'm not gonna let it take me down. I'm not going to be broken. And broken is not about failing. Broken is about losing heart and losing sense of who you are and letting life take you off track or make you dark. Hmm. And uh, so. so, apart from all that, are you a good director? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know. This is, this is the, 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 the British cynicism has to come out. Yeah, I, what I mean is, are you going to go on and do more? And, uh, yeah. I would love to, yeah. yes. But I think I have to be, uh, it's about the message for me. Maybe that's my answer, is it's not, it's not about the idea of making a story. It's not about saying I made a film. It's not about, it's about what, what it looks about. like. It's about, yeah what it's about it's and what it means. It's so if there's no more stories to tell, and I think, you know, there's enough great directors in the world to tell stories, so unless there's one I think I can do really well, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my heart's in it, then, then I'll fight for that one. <laughs> Why are you picking on us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm encouraging her, actually. <laughs> 
lot of ocean. A lot of ocean. Inbound, three o'clock. Damn it! My brother used to think that I could do anything. That I was better than I am. You keep going the way you're going, you end up on the street. Did Fox Catcher change you? It broke me, yeah. Oh, wow. How? Hmm. No, I'm joking a little bit. It, it came close, and it was one of those where I thought I got myself in too deep just because it was difficult. I think this has been true of all of my films where you get to the edit and you have that moment where you put down all of your ideals and you have to just take the time and look at what you actually have. My first cut was four and a half hours. I did watch it. For the first time, I, I, I thought an assembly of a film that I had made was watchable. I thought four and a half, I was like, that's, that's pretty watchable, but um, it's, uh, you know, you can't make a four and a half hour film. But, you know, the edit went on for about a year, and uh, at one point I was uh, alone in a closet size edit with no windows. Um, editors were on uh, a short hiatus. And um, it was like New York in a frozen December. And um, I just thought, hey, how am I gonna win this? Like, ah. You get a little stir crazy. There's a key for you. Also, big house is off limits. Okay. Coach DuPont has a vision. He would like Foxcatcher to be the official training site for the national team. What's he get out of all this? What are you thinking? This is it. This is all that we've that we've ever wanted. Mark, you have been living in your brother's shadow your entire life. It's your time. How do you cut for that long? Oh, sorry, Steve. I just want to like when you take when you have a year because I've never had that long mm. to to cut a film. Are you going in every day and yeah. wrestling? You don't take a break from no. it and go away. Or... No. So you're literally in the banging your head against the avid torture. Yes. And, you, and you think you're still able to be sort of like be objective, sort of like feel and and take, yeah. I mean that's that's the hardest in the edit. It's like you you've seen things so many times and. Do you see what an audience will see? I, I mean, what do you well, take away from them, from I, your own I think scenes? you do, because I think you become an expert on it. I, I agree, not... and I don't think I'm tr laboring to see it like an audience. I think mm. it's more that of, uh, of an actor who's mm. doing a play. The notion of doing that play over the course of eight months, um, eight times a week, and how do you keep that fresh? And it, there, there is some kind of a discipline, I think. You were close friends with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Did you talk to him about how you keep it fresh for that period of time? A little bit. I mean, I mean, he, he had his rituals and would go to the theater and he would just sit on stage and have a moment. And, and similarly in the edit, it's, you know, you do have to take a breath and you've seen the scene a thousand times, but does this sound pretentious? No. But I'm going to ask you, which film spoke to you when you were growing up? I didn't discover filmmaking or think of it as my own medium until I was about 20. So it came to me much later. I think I always had the storytelling impulse, but films were just what showed at our local. I lived in a little town in East Texas, and every week a new film would open every Friday. It was a real last picture show. So, you know, John Wayne, The Cowboys, Evil Knievel, you know, whatever we're showing. That's Elvis not really movies. the kind of films you got on to make. <laughs> no, but I love movies. Every movie I saw. Actually, as a little kid, 2001, I saw it when I was in first grade. Mm. And it blew my mind, but I didn't think I could make a film. It's not, that, that didn't hit me till much later. I was, I was always writing sh you know, short stories, and as I got older, plays. But I, it took me a while to kind of was the realize one moment, I could make a film. Was the one know? moment you realized, this is for me? I think I saw Raging Bull, and I thought, oh, wow, a film can do that. It can go to that place psychologically. But still, you don't think you can make Raging Bull. So seeing some of the early American independent I films, <laughs> you know, it's like, for, you know, so it, it makes you think, wow, this is an expressive medium, you know. But then it was seeing, I think, indie films, much more humble scale, personal films. For me, this is in the early 80s when those films are starting to show a lot more. So early John Sayles, Spike Lee, early Coen Brothers, Jim Jarmusch. You know, so wow, there's people making films kind of in their own backyard. Was there so any one that film made me that think, made you do slacker? Though? I like could get any, a film. Yeah. Was there any one film 
that came out that inspired you, you said I could do something that I don't know, know if there's any one film, but it was definitely the backyard film. You know, it was yeah. like I'm going to make a film in my neighborhood with my friends. Because for me, Slacker was at. the one. Like, oh yeah, we can make a film. Well, like I've been flattered over the years when people say, like, yeah, there's no excuse not to get a so. camera, get your friends together, make your movie about your own world or what you guys got going on. And you just spent twelve. Came out of you that. spent twelve years on one film. Ma yes. Maybe more, including the <laughs> editing. Yeah, probably 13 or so. Um, would you do it again? I don't know. It depends on what story needs to be told. You know, this is really a storytelling medium. I really see that now. I used to feel like, oh, called to make films. It was all about cinema. It's really just storytelling. What was the toughest and moment on that film? There was no one tough moment. Either they were all tough or they were all kind of methodically what they were. So, so give us an example it wasn't of a, one. It, I, it sounds boring, but it was a marathon. You know, it required a lot of patience, obviously, and it was a long-term plan, but it was fun to be able to work that way. You know, most films, to me, feel like they're a runaway train. If you, especially if you have a limited budget and schedule, you, it's running and you're trying to keep up with it. This was like, it was such a gift to shoot three days, edit, watch it, maybe go do something else for six months, come back, watch it, feel my way through what I need next year, and sit with my editor, Sandra, and just kind of like therapy. Is this film, is this element, grow, to have that kind of time at the conceptual stage, because it was always, it was like 12 films, so it was like a sculpt, like a life sculpture. We had equipment, it felt like a film, but it didn't feel like a film. Would any what of you we spend were shooting didn't seem would like any anything. Would any of you spend 12 years on a film? I haven't got 12 years to spend. <laughs> <laughs> sure you do, Mike. <laughs> but that was just... Would you? Anybody? Well, I would do it. Yeah, and the if so way what? you did, which you made eight other films, great films, in the 12 years. So it's not, you know, because I've had that with, you know, I tell people it took me 10 years to write Inception or something. Yeah, but I did a lot of things yeah, exactly. in that 10 years. Yeah. When you describe that process, I mean, when we look at each other, like, it just sounds fabulous. It was, to, it to have was, something to keep it coming was back wonderful. to take your time. To with. Just, to just, yeah, have all that contemplation time. And so what, what subject would draw you over 12 years? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, were you ever worried that anything's going to happen to like one of the actors <laughs> or yourself? What, I mean, that's the, that that's the thing. I, mean, I think filmmakers, thing. we're all kind of control freaks, right? You want to control the elements. That's our job as orchestrator, master, storyteller, you know, is to control the elements. And this one, I had to just realize, okay, I'm throwing that card mm -hmm. away and I'm collaborating with a very unknown future and yet predictable. I mean, it, the likelihood is we're all are going to be here 12 years from now, and we were. But people say, well, what if someone died or something? Well, well I hope my impulse wouldn't be about my film. If, you know, it would, it, it's a life yes. issue, you know, but... <laughs> but tell the truth here, your impulse was about you. <laughs> but I never, we didn't have, there was no plan B. But, but it, everything had a life analogy, though. I knew, like, I, you know, I, I knew a guy, and the tragedy is, I don't know what's happened to him, a filmmaker. <clears throat> One year, he filmed his landlady on her birthday. And every year, he would go and shoot this woman as she got older and older and older. But she, he was gonna not, op not going to open or process any not of the film until it. she died. Oh. Now, that's the only example I've ever heard of. So we're all wondering if we can get our hands on that footage. Documentary, though. Right. But this is like the Seven Up series of documentaries. That's true. But uh, what, what, I really, what I was really getting around to saying is that when your film came out, I just said, wow. That's such a great idea. No one can beat that. I mean, that is the, that is the definitive beginning and end. Well, it's not even the idea, it's the execution, because yeah. I'd read about, you know, Stanley Kubrick maybe doing AI that way. Maybe, you know, the various yeah, things, that, the but nobody had done it. Let's yeah. do it. And, you know, people have talked about it. I had thought about things, yeah. that, but to actually do it. Ron Howard told me he had a, a film he was thinking about over years, but every, the thing is, they're hard to get funded. No one wants yeah. to... Yeah. Oh, you don't get your money for however many years? They're like, no, no one's going to give you. I, the key is keeping the budget pretty, pretty humble. But it's not just low. the funding, it's the commitment. It's well, yeah, the, you it's know what the, I mean? It's like you can have the idea and go, oh, it'd be cool yeah. to do something, but to actually execute and it. And I was, it did cross my mind. What if two years in I realized, ah, this isn't working. <laughs> I've, I've committed and you drop it. But what happened was the reverse. The more we committed, the more the momentum built, the more cast and crew kind of bought in, you know, so it was, it was kind of a wonderful way. You guys ready to have some fun? Yeah! Yeah! Oh! Come on.
worry about it. What if we can use the bumpers? You don't want the bumpers. Life doesn't give you bumpers. Hi! Did you have issues with budget on um, imitation game? I mean, of course, it, it was a smaller budget. I mean, it was a big budget for me. I used to shoot movies for four or five million dollars, you know. And I'm so used to, to have restrictions, you know. Everything is about the restriction. It's where we come from. And, and in a way, you know, everything is short, and, and your shooting t uh, period might be six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. So to extend something over 12 years seems insane in many ways. I mean, it's like going into to shooting is sort of like this, you know you're not going to sleep. You're not, I mean, it's so intense because you have to get everything in that very short period of time. So it's, it's like this insane focus. You did constant fear of making you know, the wrong decision or not getting everything you need. When it's over, you, you're relieved and you're terrified at the same time because it's such an intense period. All your senses are sort of like hyper. You look at the world differently. I mean, it's, it's sort of like it being in a trance in many ways, I, I think. So I never had a long shoot. Do you all agree with that? I, I totally agree with it, but I will tell you, the longer the shoot gets, you do naturally adjust. It's like running a marathon yeah. instead of running. Yeah. You know, when you get to a 125-day shoot, you, you can't. You know, I've done a 25-day shoot and I've done a 128-day yeah. shoot. Yeah. It's like you, you naturally adjust the way you run the race. But like, the shoot is the shoot, and yeah. Yeah. in the end, long or short, you are only creating raw material. You, we all know you make the film in the cutting room, uh, and that's the long... However, I mean, you spend an extraordinary length of time doing that. It's not that, but, I mean, compared but, to other but, films in the but past. that's I mean. the bottom line. So, so the shoot is... I mean, the shoot is a gas, and if it's a disaster, then it really is a disaster. I mean, I thoroughly, I love the shoot. I yeah. spend six months before we shoot rehearsing with the actors and creating characters and doing that. And I don't like that very much at all, because although it's great stuff, you're not, there's nothing to show at the end of the day. All you're doing is preparing for the shoot, when, when, which is actually when we then make the film up. Have you had a shoot that is a complete disaster? We had a film that we abandoned before we got to the shoot for all kinds of reasons. Which one? Well, it didn't exist, so there's no point. It's not, in, it's not an IMDb. Uh, I'm already sorry I mentioned it. <laughs> How did that state affect your personal life? What can I say? I mean, I, I have a very understanding. Of, I mean, you need to have a partner that really understands what you're doing and going through because you become extremely focused on yourself and what you're doing. I mean, you don't really care about anybody else because you, you can't because it's so consuming what you're doing. Just getting four hours of sleep is sort of like a... So you have to be somebody who understands that, okay, now we're going into that phase. Now that's going to happen, but it's going to be an end to it. I guess it's something else if you're doing a six-month shoot. You have to adjust to it. You have to be more human. You have to be more, more, more pleasant to be around. But if, but if you're doing those eight-week shoots, I mean, it's, it's, it's very intense. Gentlemen, meet Mr. Turing. We you to work together then? I'm afraid these men would only slow me down. Popular at school, were you? We're short on staff. We get more staff then. You have six minutes to complete the task. Is it even possible? No, it takes me eight. Five minutes and 34 seconds. You said to do it in under six. What is it that we're really doing? We're going to break an unbreakable Nazi code and win the war. Oh. How long was the shoot and unbroken? 46 days or something, 47 days. Oh, not that long. Mm -hmm. And how did that affect you personally? I came home to my kids and, mm -hmm. I was, and, they, and they bounced me and it, in fact it, it made me, because I was insane when I was at work mm -hmm. and, I, and when everybody yeah. went to sleep, I had my insane hours before going to sleep, but, uh, but I was actually really happy to have a, an excuse to you know, mm -hmm. play a board game on the floor and be mm -hmm. forced to forget and leave my work a little bit at home. Um, your kids completely take they you really out. They really help. They actually they can, exactly. they can really help. The and they know, and, you know, again, they need to know when to, like, yeah. I'm going crazy Mommy's and I need a little <laughs> but, but they were very grounded. What was the toughest so moment on the shoot? Day one, wasn't it? <laughs> Day one was hard. Day one was hard because technically we were on the, we were on the water and we had a, a camera on a crane and the raft was going up and down and we were Ooh. trying to work on real Ooh. water and I was trying to get my confidence of, I can do this, I'm mm. a, I can direct this movie. And, mm. and then I saw the monitor and the person's head kept doing this and I couldn't hear anything and I couldn't see anybody and I... Lousy day choice. One. I was going to say, oh, that's, that's a bad one. You guys <laughs> sitting in a car parked by the side of the road. That's what they Be nice to yourself. I've learned, I learned, I learned. I learned. Oh. So it was, it was, it was exciting, that, but it was home. That was the toughest home. moment. 
of, of making the actual making of the film, I think, you know, I think we all feel this, like the toughest moments are the best moments. So like mm -hmm. the big emotional climax between the men was, was the toughest emotionally between the actors. The, and then physically trying to figure out, I had to learn a lot about, uh, you know, how to do plane crashes and CG and things like that. That was very confusing, but I had great people teaching me and it was such an amazing education mm. and it was fascinating. But certainly many days where I felt, you know, I walked on with confidence, but uh, I was, you, you feigned I, was confidence. I feigned confidence. But I, but I was so excited um, that I figured that well, that, that you know. On Interstellar, Chris, and that, what was the toughest for you? I think probably the toughest for everybody were the location shoots we did in Iceland. So we did three days out on the water, standing in, you know, two foot deep water in the freezing cold. And I, I've never had a crew complain quite so much about, you know, they really, really didn't like it. It wasn't the usual joking, oh, you know, they really didn't like it. And then when we went up on the glacier, they were a lot happier. We were all a lot happier. I, I really enjoy things like that. Though. So it's, it's difficult, but I kind of have fun with it because you see mm -hmm. what you're getting and you see people kind of rising to it and reacting to the elements. And it's, you, you know that it's somehow getting in the camera, you know, that it, it, you're getting something there. But we had 100-mile-an-hour uh, winds, which I've never seen before. And it actually lifted the asphalt off the road and threw it to one side. I mean, it's, uh, it was bizarre. And we were out there trying to shoot with actors, kind of bracing themselves in the wind and everything. But it was really... I thought it was really fun. And, you, you know, you get that thing where the crew <laughs> the really kind of... Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was sort of enjoying it. <laughs> but they get that sort of, you know, everybody rises to it and you feel yeah. people really come together. And that's when you feel the spirit of the collective endeavor, and that's what's fun. Right? I, I, was, I went to the Reykjavik Film Festival mm. a few weeks ago, uh -huh. and I was taken on a trip around Iceland by these guys who facilitate filmmakers, right. and all they could talk about was you. <laughs> <laughs> and you, so, you know, they've never met such a stickler, they've never met such a perfectionist. And of course, what that obviously meant was that you were really confronting the elements in Iceland. Yeah, yeah, we were. And you really were, and you've left your reputation behind you. <laughs> oh, OK. Is that good or bad? I don't know, I'll find out. Well, we were there 10 years earlier in the same spot. It's one of the only glaciers in the world you can drive onto it, so we can put our spaceship on a truck and drive it up and crane it into place and all that, so... For Turner, was it difficult to decide about the historical accuracy? No, there were decisions we had to make that consciously departed from some kind of accuracy. For example, the stuff that happens in Margate, where Turner went a lot, which is down on the southeast coast. Margate's not a place you can really film in and get control of anymore. It still kind of looks like it did 200 years ago, but not quite. So we filmed it in, a, in Cornwall, in a different looking place, which captured the kind of spirit, the light of the place. My feeling about period films is that the minute you say, people say, well, let's modify the language, let's make it uh, more contemporary so the audience can understand it, let's not have the women wearing bras because it's not sexy, etc., etc. I mean, you throw out the baby with the bathwater. So our job was to be as accurate as possible and enjoy the detail of the look, the language, the, everything else, and all the details about Turner, but at the same time, to be, it's not a documentary, to be creative and inventive. What drew you to him? Great painter, a cinematic painter. I thought about doing it just after we made Topsy Turvy in the late 90s, and then I started to look into Turner the Man, and I thought, this is a great character for a Mike Lee film, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, the two of them, the, the epic work and this eccentric guy seemed to be a good reason to make a movie. Because there's something about, which, which I find, this is the first time I made a movie about real events, real people who lived. and. Huge difference. I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking because before, sort of like your character is yours. You own them. You have complete control. They're fictional characters. You can do with them exactly what you want. You can change them. You can, it's like you have that freedom. And now, suddenly you have the responsibility of doing justice to somebody who's lived, who has achieved great things. And, and there's a responsibility of this, somebody's legacy. And that really caught me when, when I'm doing this. This is actually, seriously, you better not fuck up. This is, this is somebody who deserves to have his legacy spread out. This is somebody who did amazing things, suffered great injustice, and, and that responsibility became more than the movie in many ways. Did you fuck up in any way? Uh, I, I like to think not, uh, but, it's, but it's, of course, there's, there's, you have to sort of like focus on what's important, what kind of, what's the story you want to tell, which is important to me as a filmmaker, and then it's the objective story. 
which is the true story of this man. So, so it's, and these two things will always, you know, they will crash and, and drag. But I'm sure you found, as I did, that you, you kind of absorb and assimilate the real person in his life and work. I mean, I rather suspect that your sense of responsibility will be slightly different from mine because, A, he's more recent, Turin, and also, I mean, he was a victim. Yeah. Turner is, in a sense, more robust. Turner can but with... It is interesting when they're real-life films which categorically distort history. To what extent are you free to move away from the truth? Look, we read and researched Turner till he came out of our ears. But the truth was only in our heads. And so you then interpret that. Now, there are scenes in Mr. Turner which are, for all intents and purposes, very accurate reconstructions of famous things that happened, particularly the scene in the Royal Academy where he goes in and puts a red blob on his grey painting next to, to um, Constable's very red painting. But if you got into a time machine and you went back, you can be absolutely sure that what you would see would bear no resemblance whatever to what's in the film because, you know... Well, so, let's take so something more recent, like, I mean, Angie, when you were dealing with World War II and the Japanese, how did you deal with that ethically? What, what questions did you ask yourself? I Rush. wasn't doing a story about World War II to, my, to me. I was doing a story about a man and his life and his life was beyond World War II, and his, the meaning of his life certainly expanded beyond it. And his personal relationship to the Japanese was what was important to our story. And his personal relationship was, was very particular. He's, he's a man who raced and, and enjoyed and was, had camaraderie with the Japanese during the Olympics. He's a man who then was held captive by the Japanese and went through many tortures, but he also had Japanese prison guards uh, have sympathy for him and help him, and he credits some with saving his life. So he had a very different view. He came back full of hate. He changed that view through his faith and through his understanding that the hate would only destroy him. He then went back and shook the hands of the guards that held him captive. So I think that story, without having to make a personal decision about the views of how I'd represent a country, was... I love this story and this man because that is one of the aspects of his life. And it says quite a lot about how we need to be open and see the human condition. What's the toughest decision each of you has had to make ethically as a filmmaker? Why are you looking at me, Steve? <laughs> we are all looking at you. Why are we all looking at you, man? Yeah. Come on, you can have uh, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't struggle with... Ask um, the question, though, but choose uh, one. <laughs> I'm going to give you the answer I got. I, <laughs> I, I don't struggle with it as much because I make a pretty clear delineation between all of these facts and the literal you know, impossibility that, that Mike is describing, that of, of course there's going to be invention, you know, of course there's, there's going to be fiction in it. So it, it begins with, you know, reality, whatever that is, and there, there's no means of communicating, you know, a perfect distilled reality. There, there's, Not there's, quite the question. We're at toughest ethical decision you've had as a director. I'm skirting that. I know you are. But why, why but Stephen, why ethics? I mean, we're yeah. film directors. Well, right? I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you why. So, yeah. so here's something that interested me. Kazan uh, wrote a piece about what you need as a director. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Martin Ritt, director, pro of Kazan's, who'd had a falling out with him over the McCarthy era. And Marty said the one thing he doesn't talk about is ethics. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's important. You're dealing with a young kid on, on boyhood. Did you go in mm -hmm. thinking, I'm going to be affecting this kid's life? That, it's a good question. Of course I thought that. Not just his life. My own daughter's in the movie, and the adults in the movie were making an adult professional decision, but I'm dealing with a seven and a nine-year-old, and they're committing to this long-term project, you know. But um, my hope was that it would be a positive thing in their lives, and that it would just be this artistic, fun thing to do every year. And it ended up being that way. But I was pretty confident I would make it a fun thing. You know, kids are... Kids like movie sets, a lot of food, a lot of, you know. Um, so, and I think about halfway through, Eller Coltrane, you know, my, my lead actor, he uh, realized the bigger picture and was more of a full collaborator. And to see him 
and my daughter Lorelai, you know, come into their own artistically in that process. But there were no like big stakes. I felt, and this is my own ethical thinking, was like by the time anyone sees this, they'll at least be adults. That they'll, they can deal with it with an adult mentality at least. But I, I, mean, I, was, I was still worried. I'm a little worried But, to but this you day. do have, I mean, on some level, it's an ethical thing when you're deciding how much am I true to the science and how much do I depart if you're making Interstellar, right? Well, yeah, to a degree. But I, I think, well, everything we've been talking about with real life stories, you know, in terms of feeling responsibility because other people will feel ownership of it. And it's like, try making a Batman film. Trust me, they'll come and burn yeah. your house down if they don't like what you've done. Um, and there is, there is a sense of responsibility. And on Interstellar, it is, it is about the science. On, on Batman, it was about people's commitment to the character and, and their enthusiasm for it, which is what gets the film made in the first place. So I think we all have to balance that thing of what makes a great story. The only answer to it I've ever come up with is sincerity. If I really believe that what I'm doing is going to give the audience the best experience possible, and I think that comes across somehow. That's the only guideline I've, uh, ever, I've I, ever had. Yeah, I think we should acknowledge, though, that um, artists are by nature deviants. And uh, in not, to in not, in not yeah. totally unrelated to um, you know, the criminal mind. Uh, <laughs> Truman Capote said that the most dangerous person is, is the artist because they're really only going to ever be ultimately obedient to their vision. It doesn't mean that the creative mind is necessarily a criminal, but there is a, a willingness to uh, abandon a conventional way of thinking and conventional morals. Morton, uh, do you agree with that? Completely. I mean, I think that, you know, you, you have to be obsessed about it and you have to sort of like, you, your instinct is the only thing that can guide you. There's nothing else. You, we have, you have nothing else than just instincts. It's like either it's right or it's wrong. There's no almost right. Angie, are you a deviant? I have been. <laughs> <laughs> but no longer. <laughs> just as you still, start still highly capable of being a deviant. Mm. I don't disagree with Bennett, but I also think you can be an artist and socially responsible. But, like, there, there are lots of different, we're, we're all different things. We're all mm -hmm. artists, but we're all also other things in our life. And whatever our responsibility to is, whether it be our children, our politics, our faith, or th you know, we have things that we hold to a higher standard than just how we break, which is not what you were saying, I know, but no, how we break but the that's, that's probably true with everybody but me because I, I, I actually don't have a life or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's true. But is, isn't that all that fuel into the story you're telling? It, no, I mean, it, it's like, it does, but I think there is, like, there is when you ask about the question, like, for example, you cast somebody, I'm, and I'm broken, very conscious of casting the Japanese actor. He's very conscious of how his country would relate to him, the choices he would make, who he is. Does he understand the responsibility? It is my ethical responsibility to be thoughtful of what I'm asking the people to do, the artists to do, and how that will affect the country. Even if I plan to protect it, I need to be honest and responsible mm -hmm. to the best of my game. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes art can influence in a very beautiful way, and sometimes we can be very damaging. So when we can be, it's ethic, but if we can be responsible to something that we think matters, there's a responsibility, which I think is, you know, goes, goes hand in hand with... with can I, I just say Absolutely, that, yes. This question of moral, you know, moral dilemmas. And, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's absolutely true that we are all entirely deviant, and it's absolutely true that you really can't get down to a decent film unless you are motivated by caring about people. Those things are not mutually exclusive. I never had any moral dilemmas about my film Naked, but there were decisions to be made because it does ride a very narrow balancing act between gratuitous violence, which it's not about, and making the audience get behind and understand the way people behave mm. in a, what is, can be perceived as a deviant kind of way within a social context. And it's about men and women and power and all kinds of stuff, you know. And um, truth speaking. But, but, but and, I think... And a, and a deviant character who's a truth speaker. Yeah, exactly. I think it's the intention of making, your intention to make fox catcher, your intention to make naked. What it, the intention is just to understand the edges of human nature and the different ways people are, I think, then that... I fair. think if, if, if your aim is to, you know, put light where it had not been before, and if it's just about truth, that ultimately it can't hurt you. And um, I personally don't have a political agenda, but if there is something that I think uh, can be exposed, and if there's new ground that a film can take, 
stylistically great, but also just in terms of communicating and conveying an aspect of life and inner life. There's what no, about, there's, there's what, no, what about, what about no the means to the end? I mean, for instance, uh, well, I would stop short of killing anyone. R right. Not so of age. where would you stop short? <laughs> yeah. So 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 Werner Herzog holds a gun up to Klaus Kinski's head. Would you do that, Bennett? That happened on uh, Fitzcarraldo. You, I think you're right. Yeah. I so think it happened on all the films they worked on. <laughs> well, and then, by the way, I think it was Kinski holding a gun to yeah, well, Herzog's head. So you the, might want to save that one for the actors' <laughs> round table. That's yeah. Yeah. No one sure would you do that to get your film? In other words, what's the means to the end? How far would you go? Well, hold on, it? but yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Werner would not do that, and he didn't. No. Therefore, it's outside the remit of this conversation. Yeah. Well, let me ask you if you no, do that to an actor. Would I hold a gun to an actor? Of course not. Why would you have to? I mean, what would be, I think... Film, 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 it's like, how do you, you, you don't know. It's like, would, would you eat another human being until you're in, you know, on a life you're in that situation, you don't know. Just not sure. When you made um, um, Imitation Game, uh, where, where did you disagree with Bennett? Did you have, uh, with Bennett? Did you have conversations going in where you said, okay, this I can accept, this I can't accept? How did that work? Yeah, but the big discussion I like to have before you start shooting. I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm a big believer in, in rehearsals and, and having time. I insist on three weeks of rehearsal. You know, that's the time when you allow yourself and the actors to fuck up. And that's when you do all the, the things you should not do when you're shooting. And we really wanted to figure out how does the mind of this man work. So we spent a lot of time talking and rehearsing and trying to figure out from the inside out, who is this man, who is this character? And I mean, as a director, I mean, how do you, if you disagree with an actor, how, you know, it's, it's, it's all up to the individual Point actor. Find a gun at their head. You, <laughs> can, you can either you can go and say, this is how I want it, and this is how you're doing it. You know, sometimes you have to trick them, sometimes you have to convince them. I mean, it's all individual. The situation is individual. I mean, it's all up to But you started this roundtable by asking us about what is directing. Mm. <clears throat> Apart from anything else, you must take the responsibility, because it's your job, to create an atmosphere of conditions in which people are going to be creative mm -hmm. and positive. And, you know, directing is a lot of things. I mean, it's telling the story, sure. It's making visual decisions, sure. It's doing all those things. But it's also, it's about nurturing. It's about mm. being a nursemaid. It's about being a bully in some ways. But, but you've got to find ways of doing it which are enabling and not confrontational. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the thing about guns at actors' heads is completely irrelevant mm -hmm. and not really even a responsible thing to think about because it's not what it's about. It's a journey. Making a film is a journey. You don't start off with a fixed place and then simply try and get to that place as though you were already there. Through the way you then work on it becomes something else by definition, which will be just as good, if not better, probably better. As you say, charge the atmosphere you know, with the right energy, that unexpected things can happen and that the, that the actors can be everything that they could possibly be. So long as everybody is, you're getting the best out of everybody, uh, it's never gonna come by coercion. But the only time you might ever come into a conflict if, if somebody is acting uh, selfishly or if somebody's acting fearfully. And, it, and then it becomes another issue well, and, and how to craft it's fail that anyway, in yeah. a sense. But the, the, the level of trust you have, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually a very unique relationship you have with an actor during a shooting. I mean, it has to be like this insane level of trust. Mm. It's, it's like, almost like beyond merit in a way. It's like, it's like this, it's this very unique thing where, where he has to believe that the actor will catch him if he falls. I mean, you need that trust for him to let go. Mm. And you need to, to, to trust in your actor and send him out and trust in him to, to deliver and to make these characters come alive. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very, very unique and very intimate, one of the big pleasures of being a director. Is there a director or one film that's particularly shaped you, influenced you? It's a bummer of a question. That's a tough one. Sydney Lumet. Oh, interesting. Huh. One film in particular or? The Hill. Yeah, it's a brilliant film. Wow, why? I love that film. It spoke to me, the way it's executed, the way it's done, the way it's a uh, perfect film to me. And I, I, uh, but, but many of his films, many of his films. And, Did you ever and meet him? No. No, I read his book. I kept it. I keep it yeah. with me. I, I often like reread it, and um, and I've learned a lot about. I've talked to a lot of people who've worked with him to mm. tell me things about him and his process and how he worked with actors and how he approached material. And how did you come to see the Hill? 
because it's a great favorite of mine, but you can never find it anywhere. <laughs> when I found it, I got a lot of copies. I gave it to everybody uh, on Unbroken. Uh, everybody that's why you can't had to find watch. it. She's I can't got all the copies, <laughs> exactly. No, I just found it. I, it was on TV one night on, on the BBC, mm. late night. I, I had no idea who directed it. I, got I, just, I, and I was like, kind of this. I loved all his films, but then I didn't know about The Hill. But Have you seen The Offense? The, subject, the Offense, no. You ought to see that. Yeah, he did one. He did another one with Sean Connery. He did it in that period where he was in England. It's incredible. What about you, Chris? I'm going to assume you're going to say 2001. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, the seminal film for me, they, they re-released it after Star Wars was such a big hit. So I, my dad took me to see it in, in Leicester Square when I was seven years old. I've never forgotten that, that experience. But on the science fiction end, it's George Lucas and Ridley Scott. And uh, Well, Ridley Scott in general. I think for me, if you looked at Alien and you looked at Blade Runner, different casts, different stories, different worlds, but the same mind behind it. And I remember kind of figuring that out and going, okay, that's this guy, Ridley Scott, whoever he is, he's the director. Maybe that's the job, that film, being the filmmaker behind, behind things. What about you, Ray? That's one of those overwhelming questions. I started a film society a long time ago just to see every movie I could, and it depends on my mood. One time they asked for a top 10, I wrote like 250 films, so. Pick a mood, <laughs> pick a mood, and mm. I will tell you my favorite you directors right, right this second. Hmm. Thinking of one room what movie. What do you feel like seeing this afternoon? Like um, making a comedy. I'd like to see a Hal Ashby mm. comedy. Mm. I don't know why. No, please. No, <laughs> that just no. popped in my head. I love that. Isn't it, isn't it <laughs> not life? I'm making a comedy right now. See, the so. thing is, I never saw a film that wasn't in English till I was 17. I saw movies all the time in Manchester. They were all Hollywood or British movies. And I went to London at 17 and bam, world cinema. It was fantastic. I realised that, you know, I'd been sitting at the pictures, as we called it, thinking, wouldn't it be great if you could see a film where the people in it were like real people? And suddenly <laughs> you started to discover that that actually existed and had done for some time. That was the moment of Abu Dasouf. That was the moment of uh, Shadows, Cassavetti's first film, yeah. which materialised. That was the moment of, I mean, the whole of the new, Nouvelle Vague was happening. So there are films that inspire. There are films that you remember. There are films that astound you. Pull one film out that I still think is remarkable. That's Olmi's The Tree of Wooden Clogs. Oh, yeah. Which I'm is a miraculous film made without a professional actor in it. Yeah, yeah. He shot it himself, he directed it and edited it, and he actually, his own camera, you know, I mean, uh, and it is a phenomenal film without a moment that is quasi-documentary. It's a real emotional, dramatic study of this whole community over seasons in the turn of the last century. Bennett Miller, Morton Tilden, Christopher Nolan, Mike Lee, Angelina Jolie, Richard Linklater, thank you very much for taking part in the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable for the Directors. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent.